Hi, thank you to Suzanne Paul for today's question. Did Henry VIII regret executing Anne Boleyn? Which is what I'll be exploring today. Anne Boleyn was executed on the 19th of May, 1536, after being found guilty of high treason. According to the indictments drawn up by the grand juries of Middlesex and Kent, Anne had been accused of seducing four courtiers, groom of the stools Sir Henry Norris, Sir Francis Weston, William Brereton, and musician Mark Smeaton, committing incest with her brother George Boleyn Lord Rochford, and plotting with all five men to kill her husband, King Henry VIII. According to the indictments, Anne had met with her lovers on 21 different occasions between 1534 and early 1536, all without the knowledge of her ladies or anyone noticing. And Anne had special powers too. In around 75% of the alleged meetings, she'd managed to meet the men in locations they just couldn't have been. Norris, Weston, Brereton and Smeaton were tried by a commission of Oyer and Termina on the 12th of May 1536 and found guilty of high treason, even though, as Eustace Chapuis, the imperial ambassador, pointed out, they were condemned upon presumption and certain indications without valid proof or confession. Then, on the 15th of May, Anne and her brother were tried by jury of their peers. Chapuis recorded that at George's trial, several of those present wagered 10 to 1 that he would be acquitted especially as no witnesses were produced against either him or her, as it is usual to do, particularly when the accused denies the charge. And the Queen was recorded as defending herself well too. They were both found guilty of high treason and sentenced to death. All five men were executed on Tower Hill on the 17th of May and Anne within the confines of the Tower on the 19th of May. No evidence, no witnesses, no ladies helping Anne to meet the men, and still a queen and five courtiers ended their days on the scaffold. The majority of historians today believe that Anne and these men were innocent, that it was a huge miscarriage of justice. Now, it's impossible to know who was responsible for this miscarriage of justice, whether it was all down to Thomas Cromwell, who certainly was the mastermind behind Anne's fall, along with men like Thomas Audley or whether Cromwell was just being a loyal servant following his master's orders. I personally feel that Henry VIII was responsible, that the recent reminder of his mortality with that jousting accident made him even more worried about his lack of a legitimate male heir. Anne had failed him. She hadn't given him a son. She'd given him a daughter, and since then she'd lost two babies. It was looking like Catherine of Aragon all over again. She was also causing him foreign policy problems, and the very things that had drawn him to Anne, her strength of character, her intelligence, her political acumen, her way of telling him what she really thought, were getting tiring. This is just my view, but I believe he wanted to replace her with Jane as quickly as possible, and so ordered Cromwell to get rid of her permanently at any cost. So for me, Henry VIII has to bear full responsibility for Anne's execution. But is that something that haunted him? After all, he'd had his daughter's mother executed for something she hadn't done. His wish to annihilate Anne had led to five innocent courtiers being killed, men who'd been his friends and loyal servants. Did Henry VIII regret Anne's execution? Well, in his 17th century work, The History of the Reformation of the Church of England, Gilbert Burnett, Bishop of Salisbury, wrote the following. Veve, a Franciscan friar who for 17 or 18 years had wandered up and down Europe to prepare materials for his cosmography, which he published in the year 1563, says that many English gentlemen assured him that King Henry VIII expressed great repentance of his sins being at the point of death, and among other things of the injury and the crime committed against Queen Anne Bullen, who was falsely accused and convicted of that which was laid to her charge. Burnett goes on to explain that Theve had been discredited as a vain and ignorant plagiary, but that as a Franciscan, an order that suffered for supporting Queen Catherine of Aragon, that he is not to be suspected of partiality for Queen Anne. Theve was also later quoted by Bishop White Kennett in his 18th century work and Agnes Strickland in her 19th century work. 
But who was Thévé? Well, André Thévé was a Franciscan friar, explorer and writer who was born in Angoulême in France in 1502. He entered the Franciscan friary at Angoulême in his youth, studying philosophy and theology. Thévé was also interested in science and travel, and his biographer Manuel da Silveira Cardoso writes of how he was once one of the most well-travelled Frenchmen of his time, travelling around Europe, the Near East and the New World. When he was 72 years of age, Thévé wrote of having spent 17 years of his life travelling. But did he even spend time in England? He appears to have started his travels in 1549, two years after Henry VIII's death, and it looks like he started in Italy. He then visited Turkey, Greece, Rhodes, Egypt, the Holy Land, Lebanon, Asia Minor, Arabia, Malta and the New World. In 1558, when he was back in France, he became almoner to Catherine de' Medici in France and served as cosmographer to four kings of France. Henry II, Francis II, Charles IX and Henry III. He died at the age of 87 in 1590. Cardozo makes no mention of Thévé spending time in England or even visiting it. So where would he have heard about Henry VIII's deathbed words? Perhaps from Englishmen he encountered in the New World? I just don't know. And who's to know who these men were and if they were reliable sources? Cardozo does state that Thévé can be taken to task for slips, for errors and for out-and-out -out lies, making assertions in his cosmography universelle that were challenged by others. He also made up creatures that inhabited places, and he had a tendency to exaggerate and a tendency to accept things he was told or heard without question, which caused him to be ridiculed by his fellow Frenchmen. So, is Thévé a source that can be trusted? No, I really don't think so. The man who attended the dying Henry VIII in 1547 was Sir Anthony Denny. Physicians advised Denny to tell the king to prepare himself for his death, and Denny did that. It was then that the king is reported as reflecting on his life and his shortcomings, saying, Yet is the mercy of Christ able to pardon me all my sins, though they were greater than they be. By the time Archbishop Cramner arrived, the king was unable to speak. So it would have been Denny who heard any regrets the king had. But there's no record of him sharing anything specific, the king said, and I don't believe that Denny would have felt it appropriate to share. And I don't believe that the archbishop would have shared anything that Henry VIII had said to him in the confessional leading up to the king's death. That would have been between the king, the archbishop and God. And if he had shared with someone that Henry had spoken of Anne Boleyn and her innocence, I'm sure word would have got out. I don't believe that the only person to write of it would be a French friar in his books on his travels. But could Thévé have got his information from fellow Franciscan friars, such as those who'd been based near Greenwich Palace? Well, when Catherine of Aragon had died in January 1536, she'd wanted to be buried at a Franciscan monastery but that just couldn't happen, as there weren't any left in England following the dissolution. And this was before Anne Boleyn's execution. There wouldn't have been Franciscan friars close to the king in England in Henry VIII's final years, so that doesn't make sense. And Thévé's travels don't appear to have started until after the dissolution of the monasteries, so he couldn't have resided at a monastery and spent time with Franciscan monks in England. And we don't have any record of Thévé being in England. But would Henry VIII have spoken about any regrets over Anne Boleyn anyway? It's hard to know. He did speak of his regret over the demise of Thomas Cromwell. According to Charles de Marillac, the French ambassador, in 1541, Henry VIII said that on the pretext of several trivial faults he, Cromwell, had committed, they had made several false accusations which had resulted in him killing the most faithful servant he had ever had. But there, he's not taking any personal responsibility. He's talking about how he killed Cromwell as a result of his Privy Council making false accusations. Why speak of Anne in those final hours? What about the innocent Empson and Dudley? 
the Duke of Buckingham, Thomas More, Bishop Fisher, the Carthusian monks, the Holy Maid of Kent, the ill treatment he put his first wife and eldest daughter through, the brutal deaths of abbots and monks during the dissolution of the monasteries. Anne Askew, those killed during the pilgrimage of Grace Rebellion, Catherine Howard, and so many, many others. Henry VIII had an incredible amount of blood on his hands. Perhaps he was haunted by his actions as he prepared to meet his maker and be judge, but he would also have felt that as God's anointed sovereign, that what he'd done during his life had been for the greater good, to make England secure, to protect his people. And God had blessed him with a surviving male heir, so he had God's blessing. I don't think Henry VIII was one to regret anything, and he certainly made no mention of any regrets for Anne at any other time. But what reason could André Theve have to lie? Well, none really, but that doesn't mean it's true. Anne Boleyn's execution sent shockwaves through Europe. A king had had his queen executed and then moved on to wife number three within days. So there was sympathy for Anne that crossed religious divides. Perhaps Theve was trying to make the king look more human, perhaps he was exaggerating something he'd heard, or perhaps someone was trying to make the king look better to him. It's impossible to know. I don't believe it's in keeping with what we know of Henry VIII and his actions in 1536 and afterwards though. So, to conclude, I'm sceptical of Theve's words as they aren't corroborated by any other source and he doesn't name his sources either. But what do you think? I'd love to know, so please do comment. Thank you. See you soon.